Welcome to this audio interview with Nancy Klein, President and Founder of Time to Think, an international leadership development and coaching company. My name is Jane Adsed Grant and I'm an executive coach and privileged also to be an accredited Time to Think coach. Nancy is a pioneer in the world of independent thinking and has been since 1985. She is an author, speaker and most wonderful teacher. And I'm really excited to introduce you to Nancy today. Welcome, Nancy, and thank you for joining me. Thank you, Jane. It's a pleasure to be back. Wonderful. So before we start, Nancy, I just wondered, I know that you've been away for a while in South Africa, and I wondered, you know, since we spoke, what, what's been working well for you in, in all that you do? Oh, I think that the teaching of the Thinking Partnership course and seeing it increasingly as an important tool in itself, an important, I should say, resource for human beings every day in their lives, um, has grown in me in the last few months. It is such a beautiful framework for coaching, and I also am now thinking how important it is to go back to the original intent of it, which was that it be a resource for all of us every day. And um, I'm enjoying exploring what that would mean for people. And Nancy, I've heard you talk about two worlds of thinking, and I wondered if you could tell us more about these two worlds of thinking, and what is the difference? That's a lovely question. Um, Yes, this is a metaphor that um, seems to be working pretty well to describe the difference between a thinking session and other kinds of um, coaching or interactive helping conversations. Um, so I, I would say that the world, the two worlds as I've labeled them are the world of exchange thinking and the world of fully independent thinking. There are lots of differences, but I think the key ones are that in the world of exchange thinking, which is most of the world, that's, that is where we spend most of our waking time with people, is um, in the world of exchange thinking, which is what it says, which is that we're going back and forth in our conversations and dialogue. Um, in that world of exchange thinking, when we listen, even when we listen at our very, very best, we are nevertheless listening to reply to the person who's speaking. And in the world of fully independent thinking, we are listening to ignite more of their thinking. And you can argue that to listen to reply allows for then a reply that could ignite the other person's thinking subsequently. Yes, that can happen, does obviously a lot. I think that the exciting thing, though, about the world of fully independent thinking is that we have the best chance there because we're listening to Ignite and we are focused on one person's thinking going as far as it possibly can um, for itself without any input from the listener. Because we're making that, we're we're committing to that. we do listen in a way that allows often fresher thinking, bolder thinking, and and always more complete thinking. The world of exchange thinking um, includes this feature that the listener is getting ready, getting ready to come in. And the thinker, the one who's speaking or thinking, can, can sense that. There, it's not even it doesn't even have to be impatient. It just is different from the state of being of the listener um, in the world of fully independent thinking. Because in that world, the thinker, the client, the coachee, whatever we call it, um, can tell that the listener is interested in where the thinker there will go next with their thinking as much as they're interested in where they are or where they've been. They're not preparing to reply, though when they do reply um, after and and by invitation, they have 
much, much better chance of having an intelligent response than if they're in the world of exchange and always preparing to reply. So we get this beautiful difference in the quality of listening. When the commitment is to one person's thinking as far as they possibly can for themselves before there is any invitation for the listener to speak, and we get this state of being that's different, therefore, in the listener. Um, and I think that the um, there's just one other thing, which I, th I think that I'm describing, actually, a difference um, between the components um, that are present in the environment. In the world of exchange, there is a tension, but it isn't of this depth. There is often inequality because there is often the assumption that uh, the person who's listening, uh, as soon as they have an idea, really should uh, interject it. Uh, there's less ease. There's, there's not necessarily always urgency, but there's a, a certain kind of um, effort going on there that can be um, detrimental, I think, to the most extensive thinking and, and the most insightful thinking. Uh, you could go right down the list of components and show that in the world of exchange, all the ten components are slightly compromised. And in the world of fully independent thinking, they are in full bloom. So that's a start, at least, in, in, in characterizing these two worlds. I think, finally, I would say that it seems useful to, to, see, to use this metaphor, actually, because if you and I have a contract in our sort of, in the, in the majority of, of the way the world works, it, it will be an unstated contract for exchange thinking. Um, and if we can instead, if we can notice that, that we've agreed in this conversation that, it, that we're having this exchange, and therefore we will listen in a certain way, that if we really want the very finest, extensive thinking, independent thinking of each other, we need to agree to change the contract and, as it were, um, enter a different world. And in that world, we agree to behave differently with each other to get different kinds of results. And I just love that, the way that you describe the importance of contracting. I really notice that in my business, the clients I work with, and how often I witness the world of exchange thinking. And as you say, Nancy, it has its place. Yes, in fact, um, it can be um, exciting. And it is, of course, um, generally, uh, probably always will be the majority of our experience. But I think you're right. I think it's good to know that that's what we're doing and not to pretend that in the world of exchange thinking we will get the um, deepest, um, greatest quality of independent thinking. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yes. So somebody who is listening to this and has is picking up the enormous benefits of entering into the world of independent thinking what is it do you think from your experience Nancy that might be a challenge or in fact stops us from this listening to ignite as opposed to listening to reply I think that it as most things do in life comes down to what we're assuming just before we behave in certain ways and I think that there in the world of exchange thinking um, we are assuming that as soon as we have a compelling idea uh, as the listener now as soon as we have a compelling idea or as soon as we have a disturbance such as a little bit of confusion or questioning facts um, or are made uncomfortable by something um, that we, the listener, have, pre we, we sort of take precedence over the person speaking. That as soon as we have something we want to say while we're listening, we should say it. That that's, that's the assumption. Mm -hmm. And um, I think in, that it is very, very challenging to let go. Well, first of all, to examine the efficacy of that assumption. <laughs> Um, and secondly, to, in having noticed that, that it's not defensible at all, um, that we l let go of it. I think that it's a challenge to recognize what's more likely true, which is that whatever we think of while someone is speaking and thinking and we're listening, we can retrieve, but we can't 
get what they couldn't think of because we came in before they were finished. And I, I just think that the assumption that it's always fine to interject our thinking when someone else is thinking and speaking is what drives the, drives the um, inevitability of exchange thinking taking over. Mm. So the idea of the, the, well, the interruption is essentially the driver for which stops us listening to Ignite. Yes, well, I think that the, the interruption that we make uh, as a result of the assumption yeah. that we can come in whenever we have an idea, that interruption um, certainly then is the, uh, it's, 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 an, it, it's an impediment to, and maybe it's the destruction of um, certainly of, of any listening to Ignite we might be trying to do, that's over. And then what also is over is the possibility of something um, fresh and, and unformed being ignited. So listening to Ignite is hard to hold on to unless your assumption is that the quality of the person's thinking to whom you're listening, will increase um, just about proportionate to the quality of your uninterrupted, interested, respectful, alive attention. Um, and I think also if we have an agreement that you'll have a turn and then I'll have a turn um, in our listening to Ignite experiences, you know, we can do that. It's just, it's not a, the world of exchange. It's just, the world of equal turns, we will um, always know that we can we can stay interested in the other person's emergent thinking and not lose the good ideas we've had while we've listened. So how do we know, Nancy, when another person has thought as far as they can of themselves before they require our thinking? I don't know that we ever know for sure, Jane. In fact, I think really there isn't um, ever a point, um, in fact, when a person is thought as far as they can for themselves. Um, I think we can set it up, though, so that we get as close as possible to certainty about that. And I, again, that's another dimension of contracting Contracting sounds so cold, doesn't it? But it's what really produces the extended warmth in a relationship, I think. Um, so I think what we can do is to contract for, as it were, a signal from the person who's um, thinking in this turn. And um, that signal can, can we at least at that juncture, uh, means I've thought as far as I can now. And then if we are actually in the world of fully independent thinking, as the listener, we would ask um, a question like, what more do you think, you know, just in case more could be generated. And then when there really is no response to some follow-up question as, as open-ended and, and invitational as that one, what more do you think or feel or want to say, when there's no response and the thinker says, no, that's it, I think we can for that moment be confident that it is now, uh, we're now in a place of, of their exhaustive thinking and we would go to the next thing between us, whatever that would be. Does that seem right to you as well? Yes, very much so. And it's helpful just to remind ourselves that asking for that signal, again, it, it continues to me to build that real partnership and uh, appreciation of each other that we're equal in this together. Yes, in fact, I, I, I experience that too. Um, that component of equality shows up, doesn't it, so well with this. There's just one other thought I have, which is that in practice, um, we're, a lot of us are finding that if we just make it clear as part of the contract that the thinker will ask for our thinking as the listener um, when they're ready for it. Because, you know, sometimes people will get to the end, the real end for the moment of their thinking and they don't then necessarily want our thinking. It's just because they finished theirs doesn't mean they want ours. And I think that it's a, a, a contract of great respect uh, to agree that only when the 
person asks us what our take on this is or what we would add or what we've seen that they have missed or or even just what we think in general about what they've said or what our ideas are or something. It's only then that we would offer them. Um, I think it, is, it allows the independent thinking that has been done to remain supple and unattacked and uh, invulnerable for as long as the thinker wants it to. Thank you, Nancy. And I appreciate you sharing your insights about the two worlds of thinking, the challenges of listening to Ignite, and how we can know, really know, when another person has thought as far as they can before they need our thinking. If you would like to learn more about the thinking environment, please visit Nancy's website at www.timetothink.com. And if you would like to gain a profound learning experience of being a thinking environment and a thinking partner, please visit my website at www.janeadsidgrant.com under the tab of Coaching and Training to find out more and see what others have said. This is Jane Adsed Grant and I look forward to connecting with you again soon.